for the final session of the afternoon, we are going to zoom out and look at the view from Washington, D.C. Um, Anna Schwab, who's listed in your program and who works with at BB&K in Washington, D.C., is unfortunately not able to be with us today, uh, but you'll recognize Greg Rodriguez from his previous appearance up here, and he will be speaking with Tim Walsh, who is Chief of Staff for Rep Representative uh, Juan Vargas, who is uh, the, uh, manages the district and legislative offices in San Diego and in Washington, D.C. So he has 15 years of experience at all levels of government, and uh, I expect an interesting conversation, gentlemen. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for sticking with us for our last uh, panel conversation, which hopefully is uh, enlightening and, um, you know, as, as Michael said, giving you the, the view from Washington, D.C., which, if you watch the news, doesn't sound very good right now, but uh, Tim and I are here to reassure you that it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, there's still work being done there, and there are still plenty of opportunities uh, to turn some of our challenges, in, to bring those challenges in, into a discussion in D.C. And I think that's you know, one thing I'm hoping that you all take away from this conversation and, and that Tim uh, will talk about is the importance of seeing the faces from local governments, telling the stories that you all are experiencing on the ground, and, and giving those you know, real life talking points to your members and elected officials um, about some of the challenges that you're facing on the ground and a lot of the challenges that we talked about today. And, and it's been a pretty sobering day. Uh, you know, I think we've hit a lot of really tough issues. Um, Tim and I were just joking whether or not we should do a song and dance to, you know, wake everybody up and, and try and provide some optimism. So may, maybe in a little bit, I know Habiba's shaking her head. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think we want to, you know, keep this conversation, you know, realistic, um, but also, you know, figure out ways to turn these challenges into opportunities. Um, but I think with anything, it's important to have context when we're dealing with uh, you know, these tough issues. And again, going back to that theme of DC maybe not looking like the best place on the news, um, you know, I wanted to just kind of start with a, a, a conversation with you and I, of course, being in DC, you being on the Hill, me having experience on the Hill, you know, the, the, the type of discourse that's going on right now, politics, it, it's not new. Um, so maybe if you want to talk about, in your experience, what you've seen, you know, given what's going on right now, is that any different than what we've seen over, you know, the last 10, 10 years or so? Sure. Hello, everyone. So this is what I call the why can't we all just get along conversation. <laughs> I hear a lot, right, um, where people say, in effect, why can't you knuckleheads all just get along, right? Um, I was going to start this out, and I was going to suggest they title it, Hi, I'm from Congress. I'm here to help. <laughs> um, they didn't go for that. But so, you know, I haven't been in Congress for 50 years. I hope I don't look like I could have been. But <clears throat> the reality is there's been a great deal of conflict in our political history. And so if you'll entertain me just 30 seconds here to remind everybody about kind of where we're coming from and to put today in comparison. You know, 50 years ago was during the Civil Rights era, and I think we can all, from our history books, and maybe if some of us were around then, can recall a great deal of conflict there. We can go back 150 years to go to the Civil War, where our country split in half. People like to think the last presidential election was, was nutty. Look at the presidential election of 1800. There were words used by Jefferson and Adams that I wouldn't have the courage to say today because you guys would shout me out of this building and my wife wouldn't ever talk to me again, right? So conflict has been a constant in politics. There are some things that are different and I want to acknowledge that. There are some things about floor process in the Senate, how we do our appropriation bills. There, there seems to be some differences now in that time. In, in, when you look at our recent history, and we'll talk about that. There are some other things that are different. Um, our media landscape has changed, just starting with social media. And I'm not only talking about the President of the United States and the ability for a, one tweet to kind of destabilize democracy for a moment, right? And we do have those things, and I'm, I, I will not be partisan in this conversation. I promise I won't. I'm going to try to speak objectively. 
as often as I can. But social media has changed it in the way we view media. People forget that there's an algorithm controlling what you see. And we're in more of an echo chamber now than we ever have been. And 50 years ago, when you turned on the television, there were three or four people, depending on what are the three or four channels you turned on. And you watched them, and you listened to what they said, and you, you thought to yourself, oh, that's the truth. And then you went to work the next day, and you talked to your colleagues, and everyone said, hey, did you hear the truth last night? And you said, yeah, I heard the same truth. Those days are gone. And so all of those things are kind of destabilizing. And they give us the perception that our politics are broken or purely acrimonious. And I can tell you from my perch, I don't believe that to be the case. There is conflict. There's always been conflict. But anecdotally, I have pretty much the same number of Republican as well as Democrat chief of staff buddies. Every bill my boss introduces, almost every bill, to be correct, has a, a co-sponsor from the other side of the aisle. That is how the system works. Is there perfection in it? No, it wasn't designed to be perfect. It was designed to be difficult. So, um, you know, I think there's a perception today that doesn't exactly reflect the reality. And I hope all of us, if we watch the entertainment news channels that we see, because often that's what they are, we have to recognize that we have a, an increased challenge today that we didn't have in the past, where we have to be a more educated consumer and be able to separate our emotions from the information that flows towards us. I think that's right. And, you know, DC gets labeled as the swamp, of course. Um, but as you and I have discussed, and you just mentioned it, it, it is a place where you can, I think, still talk about the issues across the aisle without that emotion that you see happening in other places across the country. Um, at the same time, and I'm sure you, know, you appreciate this as well, going back to your home district, it's understanding where that emotion is coming from. And so it's, you, know, you and your boss are making a trip back to Southern California, San Diego, as much as you can to do those types of town halls. Um, so maybe if you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about how you get the pulse from the community there. But then going back to kind of my introduction, you know, how important is it for communities to bring the message to DC and, and have those meetings with you all there? Sure. So, you know, in a representational democracy, again, my job and the job my boss is elected to do is to advocate for the things that are most important to the district and the country, but also communicate those. And as different as any one of us may be, let's contemplate the differences that exist when a, a guy from San Diego, right, who was educated in California and raised in California, and maybe someone from, and I'll pick a random state, not to try to pick on anyone, Iowa, and the differences that person may have. So it is the people's house, and it really does have every type of person you can imagine. Right, there's 435 folks in the house. It's, it's intended to be that diverse. So communicating that dialogue and recognizing that they're gonna see the world differently is important. The only way though an elected official can communicate well and really advocate for what's of benefit to a local municipality or you pick the group back home is if you inform them. Look, my boss is in my opinion, crazy smart. I know, I know that's a bad word, crazy, but like, he has levels of brains that sometimes I have a hard time holding on to. He's a Harvard-educated lawyer. The guy rarely needs any sleep, and he remembers absolutely everything, right? That's pretty dang good. Um, but, but even though he knows a heck of a lot about finance and insurance, because that's the committees we're on, he knows a ton about ag because the district, and his per personal interest in muscle cars, he could tell you everything about one of those, that doesn't mean he knows everything about the thousand other issues that we'll run into. And so if you want your member to advocate for you on those things, you should make it your business to communicate with them. I heard a speaker today say, you know, you're good at doing budgets or staff reviews. You're good at doing all these other things you have to do in your job. If federal funding affects your life, you should make it an annual responsibility to talk to your member. And when you talk to that member, and it may be their staff, and I would tell you, Often that's just as good. Sometimes it'll even be a little better, depending on, right? Depending on what time of, a year it is and how available they are. Um, them hearing a story about the personal impacts to you or to your city or your water district matters. You got Marlene Best right here from the city of Santee, who used to be from the city of Imperial, which is in my boss's district. 
I saw her today. I remember her. She was out to DC four or five times. I remember the issues for the city of Imperial because she came out and talked to us about it. And then it got to the point where after a couple of years, she still came. I knew the issues were there. It was simply a relationship building time period. We would talk about the successes we shared, the failures we shared because we couldn't get there. But every time those issues came up, right away as chief of staff to a member of Congress, I thought, Imperial, that's what you want. And a phone call's great, a letter's great. Face to face, this affects me how and why. I think that's, that's, that's where it's really at. And knowing that your time is very valuable and you have lots of emails and you're running the meetings and your boss is running the meetings, is there any tips, just a quick follow up to that, that you would give to you know, effectively communicate a message? Yeah, I'm not as smart as my boss. <laughs> and my memory is certainly not as good as it used to be. So uh, you don't know this, but on the Hill, right, our, we have a budget we have to run, not just a national budget, but an office budget. We have hiring protocols and reviews and all those things. I got your meeting and likely I got four others that I'm taking later that day. My staff all have eight meetings they're taking, including the boss's five meeting, plus caucus, plus committee, plus the op-ed we're writing and the speech we're writing, a lot of stuff. We're all doing a lot of stuff nowadays. So you gotta, you know, the Marines, and I like talking about the Navy and the Marines from San Diego, the Marines have a phrase called bullets in the chest, right? You wanna make sure every shot counts. And so come in with what you know your high points are. You got a one pager, you're gonna hit them with three points. And you wanna stay consistent to that and know those. When you do it um, and you hit your 30 minute meeting, follow up with an email that summarizes those. Uh, it's nice that people wanna give huge amounts of info, but usually elected officials and their staff will let you know what they need. We get pretty good at asking the right question. Right? We do it all day, every day. So give them the high points they want, follow up with that, and then I would say do it every year even if you don't need it. Talk about also the successes you're having because the relationship allows the communication to flow more simply. I know those are, those are really kind of simple talking points, but I can't tell you how many meetings I've had where 30 minutes in the person says, oh yeah, I came here to talk to you about this. Happens a lot. And I love talking to them, especially people back from the district. That's our favorite. People we get to talk about home with. Um, but I'm gonna have another meeting in the door in a heartbeat. So hit those points, move on, follow up with it. And then throughout the year, it's easy to, it's easy to stay in touch. And I would say one other quick tip, and I know I'm long on this one, is if you send that follow-up email, Hold that in your, your sent folder or in your draft folder, and when you have to follow up on the issue, instead of starting a new email, hit that one again. It reminds me, the human being, of our trail of conversation, our trail of dialogue, when I saw you last. It really helps just the, the continued conversation we hope to have. That's great. I, I think that's really helpful advice. And being somebody that worked on the Hill, I know being effective with your messaging is very important. Um, so thank you for those tips. So I don't know if, if those of you people here have had the chance to walk through the exhibit, um, but there's some really good quotes in there uh, talking about local government states. And you know, we are at a conference entitled The Bill is Due. And so one thing is gonna, you know, we're gonna get to spending here, but this quote jumped out at me. Uh, so it's from Richard Nixon, January 22nd, 1971. The time has come for a new partnership between the federal government and the states and localities let us put the money where the needs are, and let us put the power to spend it where the people are. So I, I thought that was in, a, an interesting quote. Um, you know, I don't know if it, it, it's a, maybe a little opposite of what we're hearing from the administration right now with regard to the people component when you think about you know, the challenges between the urban and the, the rural communities and, and that message that's playing out in the appropriations process right now. So I'm leading you into the, you know, the spending question. So a lot of people would argue that one of the problems with DC right now is the appropriations process is broken. And I'm, I'm gonna ask you to give us a little bit of insight on these words that we're hearing now when we talk appropriations. Um, omnibus, minibus, <laughs> continuing resolution. I mean, are we, are we, do you think the days where we pass 12 separate appropriation bills, do you think those are long gone? Every time people talk about an omnibus, I think I'm in a Transformer movie. We hear it a lot, like Megatron, omnibus. They're, 
Sorry. They're almost, they're almost as tall, right? Yeah, they're huge. <laughs> so if you're not familiar with the appropriation process at DC, I bet you all are. But right, Congress does a couple things. We authorize, which is our language saying this is what we want to do, and we appropriate, which is writing the check. Really, it's committing an obligation, but just to keep it simple, it's writing a check. If you don't write a check for something you say you want to do, it doesn't happen. Um, and about, you know, since 1995, Congress hasn't followed what's called regular order. That's just a phrase saying that we haven't passed our budget resolutions, the 12 appropriation bills, and sent them to the president to sign. Let me remind you of a couple things first. I'm, I'm a student of history. If you're in my job and you're not, you're missing out. But so I'm a student of history. You gotta remember the appropriation rules, the House rules on how we fund stuff, we made those. It's not in the Constitution. George Washington didn't give some speech and say, now remember the 12 appropriation bills are essential to democracy. That didn't happen. This is our process we set up, right? But yes. We set up the process and we're not following it. We're doing things called omnibuses, cromnibuses, et cetera, that are packaging a bunch of stuff to this together. Do I think we're gonna have more of that? Yes, we're gonna have more of that. Because we're in a time where our old processes don't seem to be fitting it. Here's the good news. Broadly, if you talk to members of Congress, they all are frustrated by that. They want it to work too. There's talks should be, we have a two-year budget window instead of a one. Wouldn't that be nice? If you had two years straight of funding and you could plan for it. There, there, there's talk of how we alter this process. There was a select committee put together with eight Democrats, eight Republicans, and they're evaluating it. And hopefully at the end of the year they come back and give us some suggestions how to fix it. So it's, this process is often discussed of how Congress fails, but really they're just failing on following up on a design they created that maybe doesn't apply so perfectly anymore. Um, and you hear about things like earmarks as one of those things that we're in and then we're not in later and that we talk about. So I think we're going to be doing lots of omnibuses and, and megatrons and those types of things going forward. It's how we're going to find a way to function. But I also think we'll find a way to adjust our process long term to make it function more. No, I think, I think that's a fair point. And I mean, to your point about maybe a, a two-year budget cycle, I think it comes to a lot of communities. It comes down to budgeting and the predictability on what type of spending you can expect. And we didn't get to the term continuing resolution, but that's essentially just a delay based on the funding levels from the, the previous year. And we just barely got the omnibus passed in, in March, or was it April? It was, it was uh, uh, very end of March. Right? Yeah, very end of March. So we were already six months into the current fiscal year, and then you finally got the final obligations for funding. So. I think a lot of communities are, are trying to reconcile that with having to move forward and then all of a sudden you do get funding for something and then you need to spend it very quickly. Is that the most efficient way to be spending our federal dollars and using them? So, um, you know, we'll see what happens there. So you brought up the term earmarks. Oh, yes. Um, and it's uh, for those of you, uh, how many people know what earmarks are? All right, so pretty much, for, yeah, so, so for those on the video, pretty much everybody raised their hand. So they don't exist anymore. Um, do you want to give it maybe a little more context into when they did exist it and maybe the value they played? And it sounds like we, you don't think we're going to see them again in the future? Uh, so I didn't say that. I, earmarks are really politically sensitive. So let's just kind of take a step back and I'll talk about them. But I'm not saying Tim Walsh thinks this should happen, OK? Earmarks are pretty dang sensitive, especially generally folks on the right seem, seem to be more uh, nervous and opposed to them than folks on the left, but there's a lot of discussion about them, all right? You all know what earmarks are, so I'm not going to go into what they do. But let's remember again, and I always like to give a little context, please forgive me for it, that it's, con it's Congress's constitutional obligation to fund things now. So when you change part of the process and don't allow yourself to specifically fund something, you're ceding authority to the ex executive. Right? So there should be a question there and some caution when you decide one branch of government is giving up on part of its authority, right? which partially is what you do. Earmarks were eliminated about 2010 when Speaker Boehner came in and a Republican majority came in. They put a moratorium on, their, on earmarks and shortly thereafter the Senate did something similar. There were a ton of problems with earmarks, do not get me wrong. 
you had a few people go to jail for stuff that they did, right? A guy, a guy in San Diego was one of them. Um, you, members of the, ear, of the appropriation committee were getting way more earmarks than other folks. So there are some issues with it. There are blind earmarks, and you gotta kind of wonder about that. You put in funding for something, but you don't want everybody to know you put it in. All right, that doesn't smell right to me, right? However, one of the highest beneficiaries of earmarks were cities. They often went for infrastructure. And your member of Congress probably knows what one of your highest priority needs are because you told them. You said, hey, Congresswoman, this bridge, if we don't get it fixed quick, this whole side of town is going to be shut down for a few years as we try to figure out funding, there's traffic issues, it hurts industry, et cetera. So I'm not sure you want your member of Congress saying instead, I want just programmatic funding authority, which means we're just going to fund a trillion dollars on T&I, transportation infrastructure, but not talk about what projects in my district are important. So do I think earmarks may come back? Certainly not that name. No one's ever saying bringing earmarks back, even though the president did say so, which was interesting. Um, but I think there is the potential for some type of component that has much more oversight, doesn't have blind earmarks. Maybe it's solely limited to municipalities, right? Because nobody ever, nobody ever criticized a member of Congress for trying to improve some infrastructure component of their district. That's their job. Well, and what's interesting to pick up on the point about there not being 12 separate appropriation bills passing anymore is when they were passing, there were earmarks. And one of the arguments is that that is when you promoted collaboration by, I hate to use the word trading deals, but it allowed people to at least talk to each other about whether the needs in your community, what it needs in my community, okay, how do we have some sort of collaboration and meeting of the minds around spending? Um, and so. I would argue too, <clears throat> you know, this whole kind of, they call it horse trading. I don't like that term. I work for an elected official. I don't think that's it. I, I would argue that it's actually a little different. Instead of just talking about blind funding, the billion dollars that goes somewhere, it forces you to acknowledge what part of that money affects your district. It's a lot easier to say, I'm opposed to all funding. Right? It's easy. Oh, too much funding. Too much spending. It's wrong. It's a lot harder to say that when you have to also own up that part of that goes into your district. Right? We all, we all are much more sensitive to the pebble in our shoe, as the Buddha said. So that's, what I, that's how I'd highlight it. I'd highlight it a little more politically sensitively. No, yeah. I like that. I think, I think that's absolutely right. And to kind of back you up on that, I mean, how many people read a you know, thousand page omnibus bill? So that kind of point about accountability and justification, mm -hmm. I think is really important. And something that we've talked about today is what the public wants to see too, is why are you allocating the spending and how are you using the dollar? So I appreciate that point. So we're well past 100 days of President Trump being in office, and by my lawyer math, um, it's approximately 459 days, and we're still waiting for the infrastructure plan. Um, so what do you think? Do you, do you think we'll see an, a White House infrastructure proposal move forward in Congress? Or do you think it's just going to go through the normal surface transportation process, which is up in 2020? Yeah. So. Fast Act is coming, right? Um, and that's good, 300 billion bucks or so, and if it passes again, that, that should be helpful. Will we see the Trump infrastructure plan? And I, I just use that as a title, not to be, it's obviously the President Trump, but that's a title that's used in the press a lot. Um, <clears throat> you know, I try not to make predictions after the last election, because I found I was so wrong. But I, I think that it's unlikely that you would see the infrastructure plan that was talked about previously. It's, just me trying to read the tea leaves. Initially, an infrastructure plan was talked about a, a, a trillion and a half, right? A, tr a trillion and a half dollars uh, towards the infrastructure. And then when the Trump plan came out, it was about 200 billion, but about 160 billion of that was offset and put back on states and was, it was private kind of partnership obligations. So we're really talking 30 to 40 billion. That, that's just not enough and wouldn't be acceptable uh, to most members of Congress. The challenge with having done tax reform or tax cuts or whatever you want to call them first 
is that takes a lot of will out of the system to add additional deficits or cost or debt for infrastructure. And some of the tools that were talked about being used, things like repatriation, which is really the idea that there's all this corporate money sitting abroad that wasn't brought back because we had higher corporate tax rates and you'd give a tax holiday, bring that back and use that to fund infrastructure. Not everybody liked it, but that was one idea. Um, that's kind of been used now. So I, I, unfortunately, I, I think the FAST Act is good. I think the idea of a big infrastructure package, I just don't see the will to take on the increased debt with that when we're, we know we're adding maybe a trillion a year now in deficits, 10 trillion over the next 10 years. We're already at 21 trillion debt. That puts us at 30. That's a lot. And, and I just don't see the will right now in the Congress that we have today. That could all change, but in the Congress we have today, I just don't see it. So for those who don't know what the FAST Act is, it's the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Bill, um, which is up for reauthorization in 2020. Sticking on the infrastructure theme, where do you think the needs and opportunities are um, maybe for potential collaboration around the forthcoming uh, you know, surface transportation discussion? I know one thing I was very excited about with the FAST Act is um, you know, the movement of goods and you know, getting some of our freight bottlenecks opened up. And one of the major economic opportunities, obviously for the San Diego region is, you know, the movement of goods across borders. Uh, so, you know, kind of curious on your thoughts of how this plays into the region. Greg's giving me a gift here. You guys don't know that. So, <clears throat> so let me talk about border infrastructure for a second, because I think it's a good anecdotal uh, example of how infrastructure can be done, and it also allows me to brag about my boss, so that's a win-win for me, right? So when I talk about border infrastructure, I'm not talking about building additional walls. I'm actually talking about building smarter holes in walls. When my boss first came into office, you know, you kind of sit down and say, what the heck are we going to do and how are we going to do it? One of the biggest things that was screamed to him, and rightfully so, from the communities on the border, where we have these bottlenecks of trade, people and goods trying to move across, and we had sometimes four hour delays. You know what four hours does to a truckload of lettuce right, out in the sun in Calexico? It doesn't do anything good, I promise you that. And so, and there hadn't been about, in 10 years, there hadn't been any success getting additional funding for that. There just hadn't been. So we decided that strategy, we had to pursue that. And I'm happy to say that in the last five years, we got about $800 million in border infrastructure. And I think by the end of this congressional term, we'll have over a billion bucks. There are opportunities for infrastructure. And I want to use this as an example of how you do it. You build bipartisan support for it. You focus on the economic benefits of it. You extrapolate those economic benefits way outside of your district, and then you find a group of people that will continue to echo that over and over and over again. If you look at border infrastructure, we knew it was a cash register. It was $7 billion of economic activity that would come to our region if we spent a billion. That is a no-brainer. We would all put 10 bucks a machine if it gave us 70 bucks back. So all we had to do was reframe it as such, as opposed to government spending. And so we spent years doing it. And we had the San Diego Chamber on board. We had environmental groups, because when you sped up crossing, you reduced air pollution, right? We had major corporations out of states way east of California because those goods traveled far. And we spent money tracking down who they were, and we called them and said, hey, next time you talk to your member of Congress, would you put this in your top five? It's going to mean your, your goods get to you two hours quicker, and they don't sit out in the sun. That's how you do it. It's just not as easy as I think it may have been at one point in time if you had a senior member getting an earmark. You have to be a bit more sophisticated, but it works. I'm sitting proof that it works. And if you talk to anybody in San Diego, all the repairs aren't done yet to make it quicker, but the times are coming down. The good times are coming down for crossing, corporations are happy, uh, and it really is an area of success. That would be one example for you. Great, so one question I wanna to get to that's kind of along the line of pensions is, so, I don't know if people are following what's going on in Stockton, but you have a pilot project going on with regard to universal basic income. I think you know, one of the perhaps arguably polarizing themes going on across the country is 
you know, the shrinking of the middle class and, you know, the kind of people thinking that people are getting farther ahead and others are being left behind. And, and this, may, this conversation may just be, be starting in Congress, but is there any discussion around something like a universal basic income or some sort of, I guess it gets to revamping of the entitlement programs, which is kind of a broader discussion down the road. And similar to pensions, we also have the looming, I think, social security crisis. But are you hearing any discussions kind of along that theme? Certainly it's talked about. I don't know of a, a specific proposal right now. To, the short answer is I don't think it's feasible in the moment. There's real ideological pushback to some of these things in Congress right now. Um, I'm aware of the Stockton uh, universal basic income. There's one by the Y Combinator too. It's a little different. I don't think they'll happen now. I, I think these things are important, these pilot projects, to see how they fail and succeed. That was talked before. Fail fast on a pilot project because you want to design the next one better. Um, but these are really, I think, conversations about automation. Um, and a universal basic income and, and entitlements are, are important, but it's time to talk about what happens 20 years from now as automation replaces human jobs. And that's where I think we need to get to. And that may dovetail into our universal basic income conversation and how we offset those human labor losses. That makes sense. So I think it's, it's time to open things up to the audience if uh, people have any questions. Hi, um, you can hear me. I'm Jeff Chang. I um, had a quick question for you. About eight or nine years ago, 2007, Congress took important action to actually regulate multi-employer pension plans and shore up, potentially shore up the PBGC, which kind of partially insures the uh, pensions of uh, union workers in the private sector. And obviously did that to alleviate or avoid a major pension crisis, maybe another savings and loan type crisis, you know, resulting from private sector pension failures. Is there any acknowledgement in Congress that the same thing's going on at the state and local level? And, and I guess there's no stomach or interest in, in, in looking at the, the broader issues that are nationwide. So there's, there's two questions in there. Is there any acknowledgement in Congress about nationwide pension issues relating that are occurring in states and cities. Absolutely. I just went to a, a whole presentation a while ago just on this issue. I mean, there's absolute attention to it. People are focusing on it. That being said, that does become a state and city obligation, and heavily a state obligation. Um, you know, I, I would say Congress spends a great deal of time certainly talking about how we're gonna continue Social Security funding. Um, that seems to be a big priority as well. How, what we do when the Social Security Trust Fund runs out, how we make those alterations. So if the question is, is there any attention to that? There certainly is. It'd be in the Senate and the Finance Committee and the House and Ways and Means and how those things are done. Um, is Congress going to be the backstop to fix it? Mm, I don't know. I don't know. Right? It's a massive financial obligation. Um, so I, I just don't think with the ideological makeup of Congress right now, you're going to see that solution. Part of the thing we talk about a lot is that, <clears throat> that everybody has to be a bit more, uh, everybody has to be a little, bit, a little bit more creative in how we fund things now. There's matching funding for everything. We have to put pools of funding together. The, the way of looking to Congress to solve a backstop problem, I think that'd be hard to get to now, especially on that problem. Because Congress has a big one of its own, Social Security. It actually allowed the multi-employer funds to cut retiree and actives benefits to the extent that they were grossly underfunded. And I guess the, the issue that I'm really getting at is just the precedent that was being created by the federal government with respect to private pensions. The notion, it's not unlike, it's not unlike CalPERS basically cutting pensions for retirees and actives for an insolvent city. There's a parallel there. It's just that the federal government and Congress actually legalized it for ongoing pensions in order to keep them alive. No, I'm familiar with what it did. Um, I get it, I get it. You didn't have a question on that second one. I've learned don't ever answer a question that wasn't asked. <laughs> but I think, I mean, I think to that point, and a lot of things we're seeing is, so, you know, bills get passed you know, certain members get certain influences, but building that broader coalition behind an issue and educating enough members to actually move something is difficult. And many would argue that's a good thing, because if every single bill that got introduced got passed, then 
who knows what would happen. And I think what I, I, I would say one comment to that, and, it, and it's not going to be a helpful answer to you, but it will be a reminder that when you look at Congress at large for, sol for addressing an issue like that again, every member is going to come with their state by state experience. And that's one of the things that leads to complexities of that. And, and the interest in solving that may change based on the makeup of Congress and majorities. I think, I think you see my answer within that kind of obtuse response. When we're talking about infrastructure, you know, obviously here in California, we're co concerned about climate change. I think the new magic word is resiliency. Um, do you see that playing into future infrastructure discussions? Are there, you know, I know we have a lot of dis disaster relief funding being moved through Congress and with storms intensifying. Do you think maybe we'll move more towards resiliency planning as we talk about future infrastructure packages and bills? Yeah, <clears throat> I think you have to. You have to, especially if you are a state or a municipality that, that is encountering the challenges associated with climate change, because there doesn't seem to be a strong appetite for, for absorbing these costs at the federal government. You actually see more and more pushback for things like a flood insurance program, et cetera. And so when you talk about you know, whether it's managed retreats for coastal cities, whether it's you know, trying to affect your sewer system so it's not full of salt water when you look at it, you have to absolutely pursue it from, from that approach. There are some interesting examples on that too. Um, I like using ones from our districts of the Salton Sea, right? There was a Salton Sea Authority rep here, Phil, I think. It, the way they're looking, there you are, I can't see you under the lights. But you look at the proposed solutions for that, and it's a solution looking at the environmental challenges, looking at energy infrastructure, and overlaying those things so that you can address a problem and get a benefit. And it, it hasn't been perfectly solved yet. There's, and there's, it's going to need a lot of money. But that's how I'd move forward on everything. How can I put these groups together? Because I need a heck of a lot more support um, from large groups, the environmental group, infrastructure, energy, et cetera, if I'm going to get the funding needed to get this done. That's great. Um, and maybe, maybe you know, to touch a little bit more on the future of work, I, I think that's a fascinating topic and the universal basic income, but you know, I think that's a conversation that's growing a little more in, in Congress about how do we deal with innovation, how do we deal with technology. I don't know if you've had the chance, we didn't talk about this, so this would be a candid question. Have you read the book Janesville? No. So it's, it's about Paul, Paul Ryan's district in Wisconsin that used to have a GM plant and it shut down. And it was a, just an interesting tale about you know, job retraining isn't easy. It's not this, you go and start a program in a community college district, everybody goes and, you know, takes this program, graduates, but there's, there's still a limited amount of those new jobs. And so I'm curious, maybe, and, and I think this is more forecasting, you know, maybe a, a little more insight into the conversations going on about the future of work and, and how we start thinking a little more, hopefully proactively around innovation and and the opportunities around it for our communities and making sure that we do have you know, the right amount of training, whether it be you know, starting in kindergarten or, or pre-K. Um, you know, how do we make sure that maybe it's a revamping of the education system and just maybe rethinking with regard to the future of trades? There's a ton of discussion on this. There, there, there are these different groups in Congress that you kind of, it's a way to raise a flag and say, hey, I'm a business-friendly Dem, or I'm very progressive, I'm, and you have on the right, you know, I'm a moderate Republican, or I'm, I'm more conservative. You join these groups, and that's how you raise the flags. And so certainly those groups that identify and, and seem to work very well with business communities, they spend a great deal of time on this. There are policy papers you can find from them projecting where they go. Um, just some broad, they talk a lot about automation how you would value a worker that's replaced, and whether we need some type of system going forward where a tax gets implemented on that, so that a corporation could phase out a worker, because the reality is they're gonna go with what's cheaper, but, and you don't take out all their profit margin when they do so, but you do take a little bit of tithing for that, in perpetuity on that earning, so that that money can go towards either retraining or basic uh, income or whatever that may be. There's also talk about how to revamp this concept of trades. We certainly need 
excellent trades in the classic description, carpenters, sheet metal workers, et cetera. We still do need those, but we also need to get support so that those um, jobs are more efficient and more productive, because we haven't seen growth in the productivity among them yet. It may come back. And we also need to rethink, we used to have shop class. You know, an equivalent today would be for all students to go through a coding class, to understand programming, to understand the construction of how information flies through the, cl the cloud, right? And that's the next phase of our workforce. Frankly, we're behind. Um, you do see other countries do it. One of the things, and I'll, I'll, a little kind of partisan point, but I don't mean to, it to be, one of the things that worries me now when we say words like America first, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with realizing this is where I live, this is where I exist, and I want it to be the best, is that we say that and we don't acknowledge the way we get there is by adopting what others have done well. If you're at the forefront, everybody wants to take your idea and adapt it. And there are examples in how to address social security and student loans and workforce participation and growth in many countries across the world. And we have to have the relationships and we have to have the diplomacy to tap into those examples, take what's best and use it for ourselves. And so we do need to step up that side of our game and spend a lot more money doing it. We're never going to recreate the jobs of yesterday. Those are yesterday's jobs. But we can make those jobs grow and prosper into tomorrow. Retraining is hard. We'll have to do some of that. But we can also give the level of support that individuals will need in that training and start their kids today to move forward. I think that's well put, and I think we'll, we'll wrap up here, but um, one quote that kind of stood out in me, again, just walking through the Nixon Library, and I think this gets to your point about America first and kind of the partisan, unfortunately, undertones that comes with that statement is, um, so there's another quote from Richard Nixon, but the simple things are the ones most needed today if we are to surmount what divides us and cement what unites us. To lower our voices would be a simple thing. And I think, I mean, I think that's kind of something that we need to do right now and maybe do more talking to each other as opposed to yelling past each other. And maybe we can address some of these tough issues we're discussing today. There's also, there was a time period, and I, you know, Teddy Rex is right up there. I, I, I just finished reading the last three part of his biography. There's this great speech he gave. It's, I'm not gonna get it right, but it's called The Strenuous Life. And he's talking to a lot of the infrastructure kind of barons and the oil barons and steel barons in Chicago. And he's saying, we made this country great by a strenuous life. We worked hard. It wasn't easy. I think there's something in our dialogue where we got to get back to that. Right? I, I love that we have weekends. Don't get me wrong. Right? I love the 40-hour work week. I think those protections are necessary. I think we do need paid leave and maternity leave. I do think we need that. But I also think we need to get back to some level of dialogue. I mean, Kennedy, right? his most famous quote was what? We all know it. Ask not. Ask not. Don't ask right? what your country can do for you. We got to get back to a bit of that dialogue and share that with the next generation. Pensions are tough. We got some problems. Infrastructure's tough. We got some problems. Global warming, it's real. I don't care what you say, it's happening. We got to figure out how to address it. But let's go at it. It's the strenuous life that's the one that's worth living. That's the one of accomplishment. I think we need that in leadership, in all of you are municipal leaders, and we have to find a way to echo that through our own media networks so we counteract the other that says everything's broken, none of it's working, the solutions are easy. Because we all know that's not the case. Well, that was great. I think that's a, a great way to wrap up. Um, you know, I think the challenge for us is how to turn these challenges into opportunities. And I know myself and, and likely Tim, the next time you're in DC, will be, uh, wel we'll welcome the chance to continue the conversation over coffee or some breakfast. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to take a, a great meeting of the minds to address some of these big challenges, but I know we'll get there. So with that, thank you very much, Tim, for your time and appreciate you having here. Thank you. Thanks for listening, folks. <laughs>